Okay, should we? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good yes. evening, friends. Uh, welcome to Indian Arthroscopy Society webinar. And it's a master class today with two of the leading shoulder uh, faculties joined by four of our leading Indian faculties as well. Uh, we are lucky that we have George, Dr. George Atpar from the US and our friend Dr. Bancha from Thailand joining in. Uh, they are going to speak on some advanced uh, uh, procedures of the shoulder arthroscopy, including subscapularis uh, repair, a GT fixation, uh, trapezius transfer, and uh, superior capsular reconstruction. And uh, in the panel, we have esteemed Indian faculty, which includes our uh, uh, past president, uh, Dr. Sanjay Desai, our friend Shirish Pathak, Dr. Tejas, and uh, our young friend, Dr. Amit Hadole. So I think it's going to be a very, very uh, interesting talk because it's something which is quite advanced for all the arthroscopy surgeons in the country. Let me welcome George and Bancha to it and ask George, hi George, to start his uh, presentation uh, and he can share his screen. Great, thank you. It's actually a wonderful honor to be a part of this webinar. Uh, is my screen coming up? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. You know, um, first of all, you know, I'm, uh, my parents are both from India originally. I was born in Canada, so it's it's wonderful. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to India. I've been many times, but uh, too bad this wasn't actually a formal meeting. It'd be a wonderful time to be in India other than with this COVID crisis. So uh, so I was gonna talk about arthroscopic subscapularis. Is my voice coming across okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's one of my favorite, it's, okay. it's, a, it's one of my favorite topics to discuss. Uh, I really like uh, techniques on how to identify subscap tears and going through the different videos. But for here, I've been asked to just discuss really the double row repair. And I, I will tell you in absolute honesty, I would still say that 80% of the subscap repairs that I do, I do a single row repair. So I do do some double row repairs and I'm gonna save that double row technique for the end of the presentation. So really, uh, sorry, for some reason, there we go. Okay, so so what we'll discuss over the next 15 minutes is we're going to discuss really two ways, two broad categories in how we think about subscap repairs. We think of the intra-articular repair where the camera may be in the back through a posterior viewing portal and the techniques we use for an intra-articular repair. And then we can also discuss the second mechanism, which is our, our technique, which would be the bursal sided repair. And this can be done uh, retrograde or anti-grade. So I'll discuss intra-articular repair first and then we'll go into a bursal sided repair. And then I'm gonna end off with a new technique that I've been using for bursal sided repair, which is really amenable to double row fixation. So I call this a deltal pectoral viewing portal or a medial viewing portal. And it allows us a very good view of the subscapular. It's very similar to how we would do it open, but we're just using arthroscopic techniques. So along, when we ever talk about the subscapularis, we always have to talk about the long head of biceps and whether it is subluxated, dislocated, or ruptured, we may have to do things for it. I always hope that it's ruptured so I can avoid it. But if it's not, it's gonna be subluxated or dislocated. And then we either, either have to do a tenotomy or a tenodesis. And there's a lot of literature out there. I think both are very effective techniques. My preference is, is in a large percentage of patients, I prefer to do the tenodesis only because then it limits the discussion of the cosmetic deformity. But I think tenotomy is an absolutely uh, reasonable technique. So you can see here on the video on the right, there's the biceps groove. There's the lesser tuberosity. This is the dislocated hypertrophied long head of biceps. We're going to bring that back over, put it back into the biceps groove. And I've got a suture anchor in the inferior aspect of the groove, right? You can barely see right there. And that's where I'm going to tenodesa to. So bring the bicep tendon, reduce it into the groove, tenodesa it at the bottom part of the groove, and then you can go ahead and fix the subscapularis tear. So with the intra-articular technique, positioning can be beach chair or lateral decubitus. My preference is beach chair positioning. You can also use an arm positioner or not. I prefer to use the arm positioner because as you can see right here, if my mouse comes up, here's the patient's torso and here's the arm positioner. And I like to forward elevate the arm to about 45 or 50 degrees so I can make my 30 degree scope almost into a 70 degree scope. It means that I can then by forward elevating, bring the arm up towards the 30 degree scope. So I tend to use a 30 degree scope in most of my subscap repairs. A good technique is also to use a 70 degree, but I've just been happy with that 30 degree scope. So these are some of the traditional portals that I would use for an intra-articular repair. 
So we'll look at the image here on the right. We have our standard anterior portal. We have our standard posterior portal. And this is our anterolateral portal. In most patients that have a subscapularis tear, we know somewhere around 85 to 90% of them are going to have an associated supraspinatus tear. You can see that this anterolateral portal here can actually come through your supraspinatus tear. In patients, so you can see that I'm going to view from the back. I'm going to instrument or use my anti-grade passer from that B portal. But in patients that have an isolated subscap tear, so the supraspinous is intact, and you still want to fix it intraarticular, then what I'll do is you can see here, I'll move this portal B just to just in front of the biceps, so just anterior to the supraspinous. So I'm no longer going through the supraspinous. I'm just going just anterior to it. So this portal does have some flexibility in where you place it. And this is a standard portal. So here you can see I'm going to do an anti-grade pass. And then I'm going to bring in my suture grasper through portal A and park my sutures through the standard anterior portal. So this case right here, this is an isolated subscap tear. It's a left shoulder. I'm viewing from posterior. There's a ruptured biceps on the right. And so with an isolated subscap tear, it takes a little bit more time to dissect out, remove some of that bursal tissue. Here is the leading edge of supraspinous, just at a field of view right there. And so I'm just gonna work through all this, remove this bursal tissue, debride it, and then I'm gonna go ahead and bring in my anterolateral. So this is my anterolateral or my B portal that's coming in just in front of the supraspinatus. This is gonna be where I'm gonna do most of my work is through that portal. So I'm gonna go ahead and debride, now here's the remnants of the coracohumeral ligament. And I'm gonna just give this a pull. And as I pull it, there you see the rolled upper border of subscapularis right there. So we know that that edge right there, that's what has to be attached to the upper aspect of lesser tuberosity. And if we look down, we see that this is a complete full thickness subscap tear. There's no tissue attached to the lesser tuberosity. And so in circumstances like this, where there's a complete isolated subscap tear, I'm gonna typically use three anchors. I'm gonna place one down very low. So probably one anchor here, one in the middle, and then one up high up there. So typically a three suture anchor repair for a full thickness subscap. In this video here, I'm showing three anchors being placed in line. And now I've changed that where I place the inferior anchor more medially, the middle anchor slightly more laterally, and the proximal anchor slightly more medial. So it almost gives like a zigzag pattern. So it's almost like a pseudo uh, double row where I'm kind of dispersing a little bit of the tendon across the tuberosity. And I typically like to pass my sutures uh, from inferior to superior. So we're see we're coming in with the anti-grade suture passer from that anterolateral portal. And my fellow, he, he's holding on to the tendon. So he's functioning as a traction suture. By him grabbing on to that tendon, he has then has a dynamic traction instrument that he can move the tendon around to make it easy for me to pass the sutures. So there we are. All of these sutures are gonna be passed uh, in a mattress type technique. So there they're all passed. So we have three anchors starting from inferior. I pass all of my sutures from inferior to superior and then tie superior to inferior. The reason I like to tie from superior to inferior is I like to really reduce that upper border. And in this case, you can see, because I placed this anchor medial, I could have done a double row here. If I didn't cut these sutures, I could actually put a transosseous equivalent knotless anchor into the bicep screw. But what you'll see is with three anchors here, it's a fairly solid repair. And I'll try to push on this. And you can see that the humeral head translates anteriorly as I pull on that subscap. So that's a uh, a single row technique. And as I mentioned now, I'll tend to stagger those anchors to get more coverage across the footprint. This is another case here. So this is an upper subscapularis tear, two centimeter tear. What we can see, if you look at the arrow on the left is there's complete disruption of the subscapularis from the lesser tuberosity. And the image on the right, the sagittal oblique, you can see that there's some degree of fat infiltration or medialization retraction with changes in the penation angle of the subscapularis. So let's go to the time of surgery. We're viewing from posterior. And the first thing you'll notice is that with the subscap tear, if you remember the MRI showed as a complete disruption. But when you look at it, you see all of this tissue in the way. And this tissue is non-structural tissue. So we have to debride it. 
And so there's a subscapularis right there, hidden back there. So I'm gonna come in with the shaver and I'm gonna remove this lateral tissue to allow me to identify the subscapularis. So as I remove this tissue, the subscapularis is gonna come into view. So there it is right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the upper edge of the subscapularis right there, pull it up. And you can see how it almost wants to inset right into the lesser tuberosity. So if you lift it up and you can inset it right into the tuberosity, just like so. And then once again, this will be a two anchor repair because it's the upper aspect of the subscapularis. I place my anchors inferior to superiorly, pass inferior to superiorly, and then tie superior to inferior. So here we come in again, again, with the anti-grade passer. This is the same portal, that same anterolateral portal. So this is once again, an intra-articular repair technique. And then we'll go ahead and tie these. And there you can see the subscap sit right into that lesser tuberosity. There we go. And this is the repair after it's done. And we can go ahead and move on. So now that was the intra-articular repair. Let's go into the bursal side of repair. So with the bursal side of repair, there's really in general two techniques. You can view through an anterolateral or subacromial portal like this. And then you can come in with a retrograde grasper to go through the tendon and pick up your stitches as you've already passed them. The other option is to do a bursal side with anti-grade passing. And with anti-grade passing, I make an accessory portal right here, which I call a mid subscap portal. And then you can come in with an anti-grade device and use your portal A right here as your suture parking lot. So the next video I'm gonna show is of this technique with an mid subscap lateral portal. So here we are gonna start the video like so, and the, the suture device is gonna come in through that mid subscap. So we're gonna turn the camera. And now this is the lesser tuberosity. And this is the bias, there's a lesser, this is the biceps groove, the superior portion and the inferior part of, of the biceps groove. Here, back there is gonna be the conjoint tendon, right there. And this is the subscapularis. So I'm gonna reattach that to the lesser tuberosity. And so this is a complete subscap tear once again. So this is gonna get three anchors. And in this particular case, I'll stagger the anchor. So I'm gonna have a inferior anchor that may be slightly more medial, a middle anchor, that's slightly more lateral, and then a proximal anchor that's slightly more medial. So it covers the footprint a little bit better. And so you can see my assistant is holding on to the subscapularis tendon, and my assistant is functioning as the traction suture with that instrument being able to move and manipulate the tendon as I come in uh, with my anti-grade passer. So here we are, we're gonna come in again, pick up the stitch, pick up the next stitch on the way out. Oh, there we go, bring it back out. Load that up. And then once I've loaded that up, I'm gonna come back in. And now that I've passed a bunch of the inferior sutures, the tendon stays relatively reduced. It's not retracted as far. Come back in with my anti-grade passer. Have my assistant ready to grab the stitch past the stitch. There we go. Pick up the suture. And then on the way out, I'll pick up my next suture. So you can see that in time, you get a finely honed sewing machine where you're sewing all the way up. And so now I've tied all my sutures. There's the conjoint tendon, we back up. In this case, actually, would there's the bicep screw. This one would have been a good one for a double row repair because I could have brought that down a little bit better. So now I'm gonna go into a double row repair technique using what I call a delta pectoral portal. So this is a patient, uh, no glenohumeral joint arthritis, isolated subscap tear, the supraspinatus is intact. There's the subscapularis tear. You can see there's some degree of fat infiltration, young patient though. So what we're gonna do is, this is our standard anterior portal from the front. Here's our anterolateral portal. And here is the mid, sorry, the delta pectoral portal. 
So I'm going to place my camera into the delta pectoral portal, which is going to be just a little bit medial to the conjoint tendon. And then I'm going to instrument and pass my sutures from my anterolateral working portal. So right now the camera is in the anterolateral portal. There's the conjoint tendon. And I'm going to go ahead and template the location of the delta pectoral portal. So that spinal needle there is where the camera is going to come in through. So now I'm going to transition and move the camera into that portal. So now we're viewing from a delta pectoral portal and we're looking directly at the shoulder, looking directly at the subscapular. So we're going to remove some of this bursa. I'll show you the anatomy. There's the biceps groove viewed from the front. So we're just going to clean out the, the groove and do a biceps tenodesis. It's already been done. There's the CA ligament, the conjoint tendon. This is the superficial aspect of the coracoid. Here's the subscapularis tear, right there. There's the lesser tuberosity, there's the tear. This is the supraspinatus attached onto the greater tuberosity intact. And I'm gonna repair the subscapularis down to the lesser tuberosity. So now I can go ahead and debride the lesser tuberosity from the front. So I'm viewing from the front, there's the biceps groove. There's the lesser tuberosity footprint of the subscap. I'm gonna place an anchor here, one there. So I'll show that again. So there's the biceps groove. One anchor here, one there. And then we're gonna do a double row transosseous equivalent with two anchors in the biceps groove. So I like to use uh, metal anchors as much as I can because they're a little bit more cost effective. So I'll put two anchors into the medial aspect of the lesser tuberosity. And then I'm going to come in with my anti-grade suture passer. So I'm passing from lateral to medial. And my assistant is going to go ahead and, and pick up these sutures. So these are going to be the medial row sutures for my subscap. And I once again, I start from inferior and work my way up superior. I hope the videos are projecting well. Sometimes with Zoom, they get a little bit has, um, staticky. So this is the coracohemal ligament. I'm releasing just a little bit of it, just so I can see the upper edge of the subscap, right? There, you can see the nice rolled upper edge of subscap, so I can place my top suture in the best position to really reduce that subscap. So there's the anatomy, CA ligament, coracoid, conjoint tendon. That's the conjoint tendon. And here's my medial row. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've got all my sutures on that medial row. And now I'll go ahead and tie my medial row. It's not necessary to tie if you're going to do transosseous equivalent. I'm still old fashioned and like to put a few knots in them. And so now I'm going to pick up one stitch from every anchor and I'll place a lateral row inferior anchor in the biceps groove. So we're going to do some crisscross sutures. So this is inferiorly in the biceps groove, and this is superiorly in the biceps groove, and there's our conjoint tendon, and here's our double row repair of an isolated subscap tear. And if you want, you can also do an interval suture. In this case, I did not. So there's the biceps groove. Here's the rotator interval. There's the intact supra. There's the subscapularis. I test it, see it's solid, and there's the inside view of the joint. So this is from a delta pectoral arthroscopic viewing portal, you can see it as if you're fixing it open, but using arthroscopic techniques. And there's, so two metallic medial suture anchors and my lateral anchors were peaked, so that's why we can't see them. So what about the literature comparing single versus double for subscapularis? This is an excellent study. They had 31 patients in single row subscap, 25 patients in double row subscap at two years looking at pain, subjective shoulder value, ASCS, UCLA score, MR arthrogram, or CT arthrogram, so looking at the integrity, they found no statistically significant differences in subscapularis repaired with single or double row. So in summary, there's really two general ways of fixing the subscap, intraarticular in the box or bursal sided out of the box. I think the majority of my patients still do very well with a single row repair. However, in the younger, more active patient, slightly more maybe stiff shoulder or stiff uh, tendon, I'll consider doing a double row. And if I do a double row, I really like that delta pectoral viewing portal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George, indeed a wonderful 
presentation. Yeah, thank you. George, uh, let me start the discussion because I, I'm not sure if I've lost everyone, but I've, I've lost you, sir. Yeah, I think we have lost. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Mean, yeah. Sandeep? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are live now. I think there was yeah. Some... yeah. So the question. So uh, uh, till IPS comes, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, Judge, uh, because you have shown uh, very good uh, cases of type four and five, most of the cases of subscap, and you have done shown all the techniques both in the box and out of the box. So how do you choose your cases? When to do an in the box? When to do the out of out the box? Yeah. Excellent question. So I think for the small upper border subscapulars tear, a one, like you know, a half a millimeter one or 1.5 millimeter tear, I find them so easy to fix inside the box. It's almost faster than I don't have to do the bursectomy. So I prefer inside the box, intraarticular. Once they get large to massive, two thirds to full, then I prefer, if I want to get a solid repair, to go bursal sided. I find I get a better repair then. I find that first video I showed of the isolated one, it, yeah. that was one of my older cases. If I had that case now, I would go bursal sided uh, with a delta prectal viewing portal, very similar to the last case I showed. And do the double row also. And do the double row. George. Bancha. Yeah, Miss Bancha. How are you? Really nice talk. I'm fine. Thank you, George. George, I see your technique really nice. I love it. Um, I see that you release the comma tissue, right, George? Yeah, you Not don't all. care. You don't so, care, the comma tissue. I used to care. So when I first started practice, I used to release it 100%. Mm -hmm. And then everyone told me that I have to preserve it. I have to keep it because it's the best tissue. And mm -hmm. so then I, I kept it 100%. And mm -hmm. then a very good study came out from the Korean group where they compared release of comma versus preservation of yeah. comma and found no difference. So, so yeah. now I try to save it. But if I need to release it to get a better fix of the subscap or I'm not happy with my visualization, I do not hesitate to release it because I think there's good literature that says they don't matter. But I think in general, if we can try to save it, it's probably better. Yeah. Okay. Sanjay. Hi, uh, may I ask a question? Sanjay from Mumbai. Good to see you again, sir. How are you? Hi, hi. Good to see you. Yeah. So nice talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, one question, you know, in my practice, I have noticed that uh, if you follow the JCU classification of the four facets, F1, F2, F3, F4, and subscap tears, which involve F1, which is about 30% of the subscap, uh, the literature tends to be a little aggressive, but in my experience, you, you can divide and leave them. The real indication is when the tear extends into F2. Of What's course, I, I, I have no argument that if it is a full, full tear, F1, F2, F3, going into the muscular part, of course you have to repair it. There's no debate. The real debate is how many F1s do you really need to repair? Your take. I mean, so I must admit, uh, I, I love JC, he's a very good friend of mine. But I, I tell him not to use his classification, I find. So I think what you're saying is that if you have a cleavage type tear with biceps instability, that you can deal with the biceps and, and, leave, the the and leave the subscap. I think there's no evidence to refute that, meaning that's an absolutely reasonable thing to do. My thought is, is I'm definitely going to deal with the biceps. The biceps has got to go. And then for, for me, and I think, and this is funny because may I be so respectful in calling you a senior surgeon? <laughs> senior, senior in experience, guys, only, not in age. <laughs> yeah, the senior experience guys always say, leave it, do the biceps. Like you, Pascal, Gilles, they all say that. I still consider myself a younger guy, although our hair is the same. Yes. I still consider yes. myself a younger guy. I can't leave it. I look at it, I think I'm just going to put a stitch in it. But you're right, there's no evidence to say that one is better than the other, but I am I see a hole, I wanna fill it. Okay, thanks. I agree with Sanjay, I'm getting old now. <laughs> hi, hi, Mancha, hi, great to see you. <laughs> I agree with you, I agree with you. Okay, I have a question for George. 
when yes, you do a repair for especially type 3 how do you decide the tension of subscap because when you do single row or double row how deep you go what is the position of your arm whether it is an internal rotation neutral because that sometimes i find a few of my patient they become really tight after subscap repair and they are quite painful for a pretty long time no, I think I think you're right. Uh, so what I do is I, I use my ratcheted grasper to grasp onto the remnant of the coracohumeral ligament or where that is to get an idea of the elasticity of it. In general, I'd say that the patient that you're describing is, in my practice, is more the minority. Most subscaps are still very elastic because I think the coracohumeral ligament is protective of excessive medialization that as the subscap goes medial, the coracohumeral ligament holds it so it doesn't go all the way like a supra. With a supra retracted to the glenoid margin, those can be tight. With subscap, they still have mobility. But what I'll do is I'll check the mobility. And if I don't think I'm gonna cover, and I my, sorry, my test is the superior portion of the subscap. If I don't think I can cover it, then I'll internally rotate and I'll then even medialize the insertions. I'll take a, you know, five millimeters of cartilage off the humeral head to medialize it. Um, but I must admit, so if I repair it tight, I'm not too upset at myself. The reason I say that is, is that, so I also do chronic distal biceps tendon ruptures. And so I find that even with those ones, if I repair them tight, they relax over time. So I still think I'd rather get a subscap repair that's a little tight that hopefully stretches than, than to make it into a non-anatomic position. So my preference is a little tighter rather than medial. But that's just based on my experience. And uh, there's many other people on this panel that have much more experience than me that may feel it's better to medialize. I don't think I can tell you what is right though. Thank you. Thank you. George, very nice comment. George, I have one question for you. Uh, you passed the suture passer. Did you identify the axillary nerve? Right. The lower so, subscale? I didn't, so, yeah. I used to, when I first started, to identify the axial nerve in all my cases. Mm -hmm. Now I don't. I only identify the axial nerve if it's a complete rupture all the way where it's retracted and this, it's gone past the mid glenoid, past, past the glenoid. And mm -hmm. That's the only time because I'm worried about catching it uh, with it. But now what you'll find is if I view from the deltopectoral portal, mm -hmm. it's very similar to how we do arthroscopic ladder J, you can yeah, see right. the nerve. Yeah, so uh, my exposure of the nerve has gone down mm -hmm. uh, with subscap. What so are your thoughts? Self, right? Self, not, not need to identify the nerve. No Very need, rare. Right? Okay. Very rare for me to identify the nerve. In arthroscopic latter 100% of the time. Yeah, right. Subscapularis, less than 5%. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. And I find that in the latter J, it's very easy to identify the nerve. Right. With a contracted subscap, it's a little harder. It's more scar tissue there. You have to work harder to find the nerve because it's yeah, all right. scarred up there. So, right. Uh, I agree. Judge, can you explain about your deltopectoral portal a uh, little better? Uh, because people got confused whether it's a medial to conjoint tendon or lateral to conjoint tendon. Yeah. So if you can see me, if this is the coracoid, my spinal needle, so I can, if you feel that the conjoint tendon is gonna be here, my spinal needle on the skin starts medial to the conjoint tendon, but as I enter into the shoulder, it goes lateral to the conjoint tendon. So it's an oblique portal, starts medial at the skin, which is safe, we know obviously the conjoint tendon, we don't wanna go medial to that. So it goes lateral to the conjoint tendon as I enter into the subdeltoid space. Okay, so the skin starts medial to the conjoint tendon. Once you go inside, you go lateral to the conjoint tendon. Yes, so it's okay. an oblique orientation. Okay. Josh, you have the chance to injure the sepalic vein or not? You call the deltopectoral portal, yeah. Yeah. sepalic vein. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I think I make a small portal and I use a blunt instrument but certainly you have an injury to injure the delta pec, uh, the cephalic vein, uh, yeah. just like when we just like when we do the operation open. Right. Sandeep, do you have any other question? 
Yeah, there is one question from YouTube. Dr. Yeah. Kartik Srivalaraja asked, more majority of cases, single anchor seems to be sufficient. What is your take on that? Oh, uh, with one single row or single anchor? Raju, the question is a single anchor or a single, a single row? Single row. Single, yeah. I would agree. Uh, I mean, I think the, if, if you follow the literature, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, in majority, 80 to 90%, over 80% use single row, and I've been happy with it. I just um, stagger my, I'll show you here. I'm going to, am I screen sharing still? No. You, you can I'll, share. You can share I'll and show. You. show. Right here, if you look at this image on the right, the x-ray, that's a single row repair, three anchor, full thickness subscap, but I've staggered my anchors, and I think I get better coverage. So it's, it's, it's a 1.5 row. It's not a one, it's not a two, it's a 1.5. But I think the, the viewer is correct in that the majority can be managed with single row. I use a double row only for the, the, the big ones that are contracted. Uh, I would say it's the minority for me. Okay. Okay, thank you, George. George, one last question. I, I feel that the suture is really close together. Do you have the chance of cutting through the tissue or tissue strangulation? Because I saw many sutures in the yeah. cup, right? I, uh, I, I sure, certainly think that's certainly a possibility uh, to have mm -hmm. too many sutures. I, I'm still a fan of uh, putting a lot of sutures because I still feel my failure mechanism is at the suture to tendon interface. And so that's why I like to have a, a large number of sutures in there. Um, mm -hmm. But I know some surgeons are minimalistic when it comes to sutures. Uh, I can't. I, I can honestly can't tell you if one weighs righter than the other. But for me, the one thing I did realize is when I was doing these operations open, I was putting lots of sutures in. When I do a subscap for total shoulder, I put lots of sutures in. And then when I first started doing it for arthroscopy, I put fewer sutures in probably because I just didn't know how to deal with them. I wanted to minimize and make the repair easier. And now as I've gotten better, I expect I do the same when I do open, I would do it arthroscopically. Yeah. yeah. George, one more question from Dr. Karthik. Uh, what do you do to the comma tissue when you work from intraarticular as well as from bursal side? Yeah. So from intraarticular, I, I expose the comma tissue, but then I get my lateral grasper, my, my, my anterior passer has to come in underneath the comma tissue. So if the comma, I'm not sure, I, I come in like this, I leave it in the waist. It's it's kind of like leaving the biceps when you fix it intraarticularly. Just you just have to remember which way you come in so that you don't tangle it around there. It's a little bit more finicky, but still very possible. On the bursal side, it's much easier, especially if you're using bursal side retrograde passing, because then you're it's a single step. So I would say that if you're going to do a bursal side and save it, it's much easier to do uh, with a retrograde passing technique. Okay. Uh, yes, Sandeep. Yeah, Dr. George, uh, uh, there is another question from Dr. Karthik. In majority of the cases, actually the question was majority of the cases, single anchor seems to be sufficient. What do you think? It was single anchor. Yeah. Um, was he so, asked again? <laughs> yeah, no. sorry. So I would say that, you know, for small upper border, the way I think about suture anchors is, is in centimeters. If it's a cent one centimeter tear, one suture anchor. It's closing closer to two centimeters, two suture anchors. If it's three centimeters, it's three suture anchors. So, and that's with respect to single or double. So if it's a double row, it's three suture anchors and two in the in the in the, the, the lateral row. But it's always that medial row or the single has to be the for me about a centimeter. So if it's a one centimeter tear, one suture anchor, two centimeter tear, two suture anchors. That means one anchor with the four uh, sutures. All, yes. all double, double loaded. Part. Double loaded. Correct. Sorry. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandeep, can we go to the next talk? Yes, yes are... sir, we can go to the next talk now. So, uh, we would like to invite Dr. Uh, Bancha for his uh, talk on arthroscopic GT fixation. Bancha, I think you're on mute. 
bunch. I'm not sure if you can hear me. You're on mute. Unmute. Okay. Uh, there you go. You see my screen, right? And Bancha, and I think you have to share only the, your uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, sir, that's okay. Is only PowerPoint doesn't work. But uh, okay. Yeah. Slides are not very clear. Oh, they have two ways. Uh, so you want to make a clear view. I remove, I optimize screen sharing view. Good. Now it's clear, right? Yes. Yes. It's better now? Yeah. Yeah, better. Yeah, it's better. So, Dr. Bancha Chinchuti from Thammasat University, Bangkok, Thailand. So, thank you for the invitations. I, I thank my fellows, Dr. Alisna from Indonesia and Dr. Shannon from Thailand for preparing this case. So, I'm talking about the arthroscopic greater tuberosity avulsion fixations. So, let's see this patient. He had a shoulder pain. Actually, two years ago, he fell from bicycle and had pain on his right shoulder. He went to see an orthopedic doctor at that time and received that diagnosis as a calcific tendinitis. But he had that pain for a long, long time. And two months uh, before coming to hospital, he had the shoulder dislocation while riding the uh, big bite. So he told me he riding like this, the big bite. So he feel that it's shaking and he feel the shoulder pop out. Yeah, before the, uh, be before the accident. So this patient had the shoulder injury for two years, but two months of the shoulder dislocation. So this is his x-ray at the emergency room. Okay, he had entry dislocation and see this piece of board, right? Okay, so I feel that the piece of bone is not acute because the size of bone is small, but the defect is big. Okay, I think that should be the chronic uh, GT injury. So this is the films after the reduction. Okay, you see that it's sclerotic and this piece also sclerotic. Okay, I think, I think this one is a chronic GT avulsion and the dislocation is because the he has no loaded cuff and that the dislocation like dislocation in elderly. So this is an indication for GT avulsion fixation, okay? We accept five millimeters in active patients. In the past, we accept one centimeters, but nowadays everyone know that we accept it less, right? For the uh, general people, we accept five millimeters. For the athletes or overhead athletes, overhead workers, we accept only three millimeters, right? And nowadays, the arthroscopic fixation getting very good, very good results, right? So this patient, we use the arthroscopic approach. Then we get in. Yeah, first we do the subacromian decompression. He also have the acromian spur. So after we remove the spur, okay, I clean the subacromian bursal tissue, okay? And then we remove all the bursal tissue to expose the Tubulosity. And I feel that the, this uh, piece of bone cannot easily reduce because it's chronic. Yeah, I think it's two years of this injury. So the next thing I, I need to release the uh, colocohumeral ligament, right? Identify the colocoid process. See that this is colocoid process, okay? So after you release, this is colocoid process. The tip is here. So this is a base of colocoid. So after you release the colocoid base, right? Yeah, that way. And this is the scar tissues, right? Remove this piece of bone away from the colocoid, from the subacromian space, okay? I think this is a very critical point. Yeah, after that, the piece of bone is getting mobile and then we do the cleaning in the subacromian space okay remove all the bursal tissue i think exposure is the key and on the right side this is the uh, conjoint tendons right this is the uh, colocoid process okay so this is ac joint 
reclaiming. So I think cleaning is, is important. So I, I spend a lot of time for cleaning to make the better view, stop the bleeding. Okay. Cleaning the roof that way. Okay. Before starting to do any surgery. Okay. So next step is I do the fracture site and rotator cuff evaluation. I identify the tuberosity. You see that this is quite sclerotic, right? Yeah, and remove all the bursal tissues. Okay. So that is the crater of the GT. Okay. So after that, after that, so that is the avulsion. I use the suture hook. So the way to go is I go medial, okay? Just at the junction between the bone, tendon junction, yeah, use a suture hook. And I pass the suture before, okay? Like a shuttle, right? So I use a shuttle in, in a different color Okay, one, and then another one. Not go into the bone, yeah? You go into the junction between the bone, tendon junction. Okay, that way. So we use different sutures, okay? So we're not confused. So that way, okay? And now, and then try to reduce. So I use triple load anchors, right? I, I plan to use triple load anchors. I have 12 sutures, but I put only six holes, only six. One hole, I have two sutures, okay? So I will not have too many sutures in the cuff, but I have more sutures. This suture will distribute and put the um, wider area, okay? And we have better contact. So after that, we prepare the bone bed. This is quite important. Yeah, you need to, I prefer to use the shaver, okay? And then I do the micro fracture at the tuber tubercle, remove the spur. Okay, you see some spur there, okay? They move the spur and use the micro fracture. So that's important because you need to promote the healing. Yeah. You see that this is not fresh because the tuberosity is quite sclerotic. Okay. And using this, the micro fracture, I think we can promote the healing. Okay. Next step is to make a medial row anchor pressment. Okay. I prefer to use the uh, triple load. You see that we have 12 sutures, 12 sutures. And I think this uh, soft anchor is quite nice. Soft anchor, especially because you can, sometimes if you find a very soft bone, you can change the direction and the hole is quite small. So I prefer the soft anchor, triple load, soft anchor. Okay, like that way. And then I pass the suture into, uh, use a shuttle, right? Pass this suture into the cuff, okay? That will be really easy because uh, you put the suture first, you, you make a shuttle to the tuberosity first. Put the suture, um, I mean, I put the suture shuttle first before I put the anchor. So the suture will not obstruct your view, okay? If you put the suture anchor first, there'll be a lot of suture and you will confuse. That obstruct your view. So I prefer put the shuttle first and then after that, I, I put the middle row anchor, okay? And then, then we make the knot tying on the middle row, okay? So I think that's important to put the knot tying because many years ago, I tried the knotless, but I found that the reduction is not nice. 
because I think not tying is quite important because you need to block the bone, okay, to the footprint. And this suture bridge will put the bone to the footprint. So it's not like low tender cuff. If you don't tie the knot, the x-ray post up will be ugly. So we recommend you to tie the knot to the middle row. But I just put only, uh, I, I put less hole than the sutures, right? One hole, I put two sutures. So uh, we will have less suture on the cuff. Yeah. And after that, after you tie the knot, yeah. Then you can do the suture bridge, right? So we have 12 sutures. So we go separate it half to the anterior. And yeah, we reduce this. Okay, I identify the bicep groove. Yeah, this is bicepital groove, right? I want to put my anchors, the anterior one, very anterior. Okay, this is uh, uh, the posterior one. Let's go back again. Okay, so I go to the posterior and anterior. I, I want to spread this lateral row as far as possible. This is a posterior one, right? So I put it very close to the infraspinatus insertion, close to the posterior cortex, okay? And internal rotation, okay? The benefit of this bit shaft position is that when you put the lateral anchor, you can internal external rotation, okay? So this lateral row will uh, put it as far as possible, right? Here, I find a good bone and then, yeah, you see external rotations, Okay, I put the anterior one, right? So you see in one hole, we have six sutures. Okay, so we have totally 12. So the good things of you have many sutures is that you have wider area of the suture and pressure distribution because you want, you need pressure to push on the, on the, uh, this piece of bone for the better healing. Okay, so that's my idea. So after that, you can get this repair, right? So, the two rusty heel um, put in the footprint nicely, but I still see some gap. I still see some gap underneath, right? So you see, this is a post-operative x-ray, okay? The two rusty put it lower than the uh, head. It's about eight millimeters. This is okay, but you see some gap here, right? Because this piece of bone is smaller than the gap, uh, than the crater. So I follow the patients one month, okay? And then four months, okay? Now you see the gap is getting less and less, okay? And this is about four months. Yeah, I just see the patient last, last week. So he's doing very well and the blend of motion is coming back, okay? Internal rotation and also he has the very good function, right? Of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus also. Okay. Okay, good functions. So this is about four months after the surgery. So from the literature, they found that arthroscopic uh, versus open fixation. There's no clinical significance difference in time to union, also the complications and outcome, right? So my final conclusions for the arthroscopic GT fixations is that this is minimal invasive, it's quite safe, effective procedures. And also you can have better release. If you do open surgery, you cannot go that far. You cannot release colocotumular ligament. You cannot pass the suture easily, okay? Because you're working underneath this very narrow space, right? So I think for the arthroscopic, I can do better release. I can pass the suture from the scope easier and can go deeper, okay? And also we, can address the intraarticular pathology at the same time, okay, and very fast recovery, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pancha. Uh, excellent uh, technique for the greater diversity fixation. Thank you. Uh, and my question is, uh, now if you are uh, seeing the same patient in a 65 years old osteoporotic bone, yeah. do you have any tips and techniques for the uh, better uh, holding? Uh, 
I think I, I will I will discuss with the patients. If the patient coming uh, very chronic and the GT migration is too far, is too far to like the pate tree to the greenoid level, and AHI is very really narrow, pseudopalalysis. In that situation, I will not hesitate to do reverse. Okay, I discuss uh -huh. with the patient because the result of this is not so good. Is that chronic? and retracted that far. But anyway, many times I will try to get in and try to release first. If is it impossible to reduce, I back up the reverse for the patients. Okay. Okay. Do you consider the size in any condition, any case that will go for open reduction or arthroscopy? Right, right. That's true. The size of the fracture is also important. Uh, if the big size uh, of the bone, I, I prefer to do open surgery. Yeah, open fixations. Okay. Pancha, can yes, I ask Pancha. a question there? Yes, Thank sir. You. Yes, sir. Yeah, Pancha, nice video and technique. And Thank I have you. done I have done a few of these, but I don't like to do these when they are chronic, like in your case, almost two okay. years, two years chronic. Yeah. Uh, uh, if they are fresh, they are fun to do and uh, good result. But when they are chronic, like this case, I would rather do a mini open and finish it off in perhaps half the time. Yeah. Uh, and also in fresh, but large pieces, which you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. But but uh, chronic, I don't see uh, much uh, benefit in doing arthroscopic because it takes away too much time, too much dissection. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your thought? Uh, yeah, I, I thought different. Sanjay, I have one patient that is very chronic. So my problem is when the GT is a uh, is, uh, medial disc press too much, I cannot pass my sutures to the bone tendon junctions. And also I cannot release, I cannot pass my suture hook to the GT. That, that's my feeling. For the patient that have very medial retraction, I prefer to do the arthroscopic technique. Yeah. Okay. I can do better release. I can pass the suture easier. Yeah. That, that's my feeling, right? Right, okay. Thank you. Dr. Bancha, yes? Uh, so Dr. Bancha, my question to you is that what are your indications for doing an acute capsular labral repair in a patient who has an acute GT fracture? Yeah, so uh, capsular labral repair, I always check. I always check uh, my labral. If the GT avulsion, okay, is the... Um, is not dispressed too much, and the patient have coming with the instep in uh, liquid instability. Yeah, I mean the the piece of bone and the displacement is not too far, but the patient has obvious instability. Most of the time, this is a combined lesion. You have label tear, also you have GT injury, but most of the cases of GT, it's it's have the um, less label injury in my experience. Yeah, but I saw some patients that have both. Yeah, but most of the time that piece of bone is not dispressed too far. Yeah, because it shared the load to, to the labrum, I think, and some part to the GT. Okay, and do you recommend using a fluoroscopy, especially when you have these old GT fractures and you're doing them arthroscopy because there'll be a lot of fibrosis which is around the fracture sites. Right, you right, you can that? do arthroscopy to the do means fulloscopy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Pancha, Pancha, Pancha. Pancha. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Amit. Such a medial migration, and still uh, you got it medially such a nice But the most common, I mean, that uh, such a medial migration is the position, I suppose. The position in which uh, after reduction the GT factor usually they immobilize in adduction and internal rotation in a simple arm swing out. To you, to medium this uh, meeting, I want to suggest that we should always immobilize in abduction and neutral rotation. What you say, sir? Yeah. Because we can't treat each and every neglected G I mean, each and every dislocated GT factor. I can uh, hear very well, but you, you mentioned about the abduction, right? Yeah, yeah. It's operative, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's right. I agree. I, I forget to mention about the post operative care. So, this kind of patient, we treat them like massive rotator cuff tear. We need to reduce the tension of the rotator cuff by abduction, external rotation, and really delay rehabilitation. Okay? So, yeah, treat them like massive rotator cuff tear. A lot of cases do come. Uh, elderly patients with amputation of shoulder, they do have a GD factor which usually gets reduced on table B C M C on uh it's in case that uh, uh we give uh if we give us a simple clean with internal additional addiction uh yeah, and after we follow them after a week or ten days or so it gets migrated. So they, this meeting I want to uh, the public uh, meeting and uh, forum should get a message that all all the patients of the uh, dislocation should be immobilized in abduction and neutral rotation. This is what I want to say. So that it should not dislocate. Is that my answer? The sound is not clear. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 your microphone yeah, it, is not clear. Yeah, it's, oh. is there. Some echo is there. Uh, Sorry. Amit, can you type the question in the chat so we can put it? That. Yeah, Amit, have yeah. you opened in two devices? That's why it's. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Close your YouTube, I think. YouTube device, otherwise. Uh, there's okay. one there question is... from YouTube, uh, Bancha. Yes. Uh, by Dr. Venkat Raman. Do you place mm -hmm. the medial anchor in the medial edge of the fracture cavity or further medial to the fracture? I, I put the anchors at the, at the junction between the cartilage and the defect. The medial anchor, right? And you, you have to be very careful because sometimes the bone is quite soft, especially in the acute situation, right? You can lose the medial anchor. So you can do two ways. You can use the metal anchor or you can use the anchor and then you shed the ankle, right? If you go this way, it will be soft. Understand? You go this way. That's the soft bone. So you need to shed the anchor this way into the subchondral bone. This way, okay. That you can you can have a better uh, stability, okay, and better pull out strength. And I I like to use this the uh, soft anchor because sometimes you can go deeper. You can tap 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 tap. Yeah, in case it's very soft bone, you can tap 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 tap. Yeah, deeper. Sometimes you can go to the opposite cortex, okay, and then pull. It always strong. I never lose the anchor. Yeah. You can change the angle and can put it deeper. Can I make a comment? Yes, I, George. I, I think that was a very good question because I remember when I first started doing these, I actually did one yesterday. Yeah. I can show the case when I start. But I used to put the anchors just on the medial side of the fracture bed. And then because the tendons, because the sutures are going through the tendon, I would, it insets the fragment into <laughs> the defect and flips it up. And so now I've switched to putting my anchors, just as you said, right on the articular cartilage because as the tendon, as the sutures go through the tendon, then it reduces the, the bone mm -hmm. better. Right. Um, I found before I was reducing the tendon into the defect and kicking the bone piece out. But, mm -hmm. uh, but one comment with respect, if they're osteopenic and comminuted for me, I tend to do those open now with a suture plate. I find that I, those little old ladies, you put a suture in for me and you tug it and it comes right out. So I've gone to an open with a I put a plate on and pass my sutures horizontal mattress through the holes in the plate and use yeah. the plate to pull the piece down. Yeah. Right. But right. another good advantage of the arthroscopic is, is that um, this case I was going to show next when I did yesterday, he had an axillary nerve palsy. So I could arthroscopically see the full nerve, see that I was mm -hmm. on tension and yeah. then compress the nerve too. Right. George, do you consider the size of the fragment uh, about uh, to go about arthroscopic or open? How in most of my arthroscopic, they're all small, younger people with comminuted pieces, and I'll do those arthroscopically. Yeah. If it's one of the, you know, those big posterior, big articular pieces, I, I'll do those arthroscopically, but I'll use cannulated screws. Like I'll um, use the screws from the ladder J set. Yeah. Uh, but also those big ones, if they're older, I'm, I'm okay doing them open too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. As, as the professor said. You know, it, it, I did one yesterday. It was a bank cart, comminuted tuberosity, axial nerve neurolysis, did it all. And it took me three hours. It took a <laughs> long time because he's young. He's three weeks out. 
yeah. versus yeah. open that yeah. probably would have taken me an hour hour and a half open yeah. Yeah. right okay. thank you george thank you george uh, i think we can go ahead with your next talk yeah george. Sure. thank you thank you bancho uh, this is actually this is funny this is the case that i did uh yesterday so 22 years old uh comminuted tuberosity piece right here multiple fragments like there and I did the same I use fluoroscopy always and these are going in through the uh, cartilage and you can see that and then I, I don't want to tie them too tight because if I tie them too tight sometimes I feel the piece gets too hard and I can't manipulate it so then I, I tie I agree that I have to tie them and then I just loosely bring them over and I got two uh, peak uh, knotless anchors down here so five anchors did the axillary nerve and also fix the bank art too. So lots of work. But so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the lower trapezius uh, transfer when and how. Uh, so over the next 10 minutes or so, we'll go through my rationale from going from latissimus uh, to lower trapezius, uh, go through the indications of when I do this operation, uh, go through the technique. I have a short five minute video and then also the outcomes, both my outcomes and what are reported in the literature. So I always start off with this slide whenever I give this presentation that there are many epic battles occurring across the world. And one of them right now is our battle with COVID, but we also have a battle when it comes to the management of massive rotator cuff tears in that if you look at all the operations that are available, debridement, biceps, partial rotator cuff repair, superior capsule reconstruction, balloon, latissimus, lower trapezius, reverse. There's not one study out there that shows any one of these is better than the other. So there's literature to support all of these different studies. So the epic battle is, is we have to come to the right uh, operation. Hopefully we will as the years go by. So what was uh, my rationale for switching or starting to do the lower trapezius transfer? The first was, is I identified that there was many different operations out there and they were it all seemed like when you looked at the literature for every one of those operations other than for reverse it was a 60 to 80 percent satisfaction rate and uh, i found when i was doing personally latissimus dorsi for massive cuff tears my outcomes it was hard but they weren't that good i felt that they were maybe much more unpredictable and then I met my friend, I know my friend Bassem Alassane. He said, well, you know, George, you shouldn't do the lower uh, latissimus. You should consider the lower trapezius. And I said, well, why? And so we talked about it. And so he was the reason I really switched and started to do this operation. So what are my indications for doing this operation? So they have to have a symptomatic uh, irreparable or failed posterior superior cuff tear. So revision procedure or irreparable posterior superior cuff tear. They cannot have true anterior superior escape or true pseudoparesis because I find that those are ineffectively managed with a tendon transfer. I believe they have to have a good anterior force couple. So it means they have to have a good subscap, whether it's intact or it's repairable, both are options. And right now I only do a lower trapezius if they have a lag sign. Very rarely will I do a lower trapezius if they do not have a true external rotation lag sign and ideally no arthritis because in those patients I'll typically indicate those for a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So what is the technique of the lower trapezius? This can be done uh, open or arthroscopic. There's no advantage to doing an open or arthroscopic. They're both excellent techniques. Here are really the champions of this lower trapezius. Bertelli surgeon, uh, plexus surgeon from Brazil, Bassam al -Hassan shoulder surgeon from Mayo and Philippe Valentia, shoulder surgeon from Paris. I think they really kind of championed this operation. And so uh, I've learned from them. And so that's why I do this operation. I do it arthroscopically and I'll go through the arthroscopic technique. So if you look at the lower trapezius, this is a, a illustration that I borrowed from my friend Bassam. You can see that here is the lower trapezius attaching onto the more medial aspect of the uh, scapular spine. And here is the infraspinatus. So they have a very similar uh, line of action. So here's the lower trapezius. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna detach it from the medial spine, transfer it into the shoulder. The problem is it's not long enough. So you need to have some sort of graft. So you can use allograft or autograft. My preference is to use autograft and I use semitendinosis to make up that distance to attach it onto the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. So I attach my lower trapezius into the 
footprint of the lower infraspinatus and the teres minor, not over the top. And so with the arthroscopic assisted technique, I place my patients into beach chair. I make a vertical incision rather than a horizontal incision. I find a vertical incision, uh, so, pardon me, I make a horizontal incision rather than a vertical incision, as you can see here in the dark black. And then I harvest a semitendinosus from the ipsilateral knee at the same time. So this is a 54 year old male patient of mine. He's got right shoulder pain. He's had a prior failed arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. He's got a little bit of stiffness. Uh, he can only get to maybe uh, 90 degrees of active forward elevation. This is his good side. He's got excellent external rotation. This is his injured side. He has an external rotation lag sign. So because he had failed a prior rotator cuff tear, has a massive supra and infraspinatus tear with an external rotation lag sign, I indicated him for a revision repair and a lower trapezius tendon transfer. Here's his MRI. You can see on the left, massive cuff tear. You see on the sagittal images, grade four fat infiltration within the infraspinatus, some atrophy, and maybe grade two or three infraspinatus, supraspinatus fat infiltration. And so this is the setup for surgery. So uh, beach chair positioning, articulated arm positioner, access to the medial border of the scapula. And here's my fellow, he's already started to harvest the semitendinosus on the ipsilateral knee. So we'll get started with the video. This is my other fellow, Christy, she's gonna help out. So there's the positioning. So I like to sit down, there's the medial, there's a the scapular spine. Here's where we're gonna find the lower trapezius. I'm gonna make that horizontal incision, dissect through the soft tissues in the back, through the fat, down to the trapezius. I'm gonna hook the inferior border of the trapezius, like so. And then once I've hooked it right there, I'm gonna fully detach it from the scapular spine. So I'm just gonna remove it directly off the medial aspect of the scapular spine all the way to the medial border. And this is it right there. And remember, we're only seeing the tip of the muscle. The majority of the muscle is medial. So it's a very big muscle. We're gonna harvest the semitendinosus. And here's our semitendinosus graft, which I'm now gonna suture into the lower trapezius. So I do multiple, multiple sutures. And there it is right there, give it a tug, nice and solid. And now I'm gonna do a, a flipped, a double loop reconstruction, very similar to an ACL. Now we're gonna go inside the shoulder joint. So a posterior viewing portal. Remember from the MRI, massive rotator cuff tear. This right there is the teres minor. So you can see a good view of the teres minor insertion right there posteriorly. And so now I'm gonna go ahead and do my standard debridement. There's the teres minor again, viewing from posterior lateral. So I'm gonna make a transosseous tunnel, just like an ACL reconstruction in the knee. We're gonna do a transosseous tunnel from the back of the humerus through the humeral head to the front of the humerus. So here's the outlet. So there's the fascia, deep fascia of deltoid. The graft is gonna come through the infraspinatus outlet underneath the spine, in through the transosseous tunnel, and I'm gonna attach flip it over a loop endo button. So here's, we're gonna make our transosseous tunnel. This is a ACL guide pin. I'm gonna start along the posterior aspect of the humerus inside the footprint of the infraspinatus. And I'm aiming it for the biceps groove because that has the best quality bone for me to flip my cortical button. So here's the biceps groove. There's my guide pin going through the humerus from back to front, <clears throat> pardon me. Now I'm gonna pass this percutaneously out the front. So now I've got a guide pin going completely across the humerus. And now I'm gonna make my transosseous tunnel identical to how you would do an ACL reconstruction. So reamer, there's a larger reamer. So now I've got everything set up. And so now I'm gonna pass a number two bike roll as my suture shuttle. Out, starting in the back, through the humerus, out the front, like so. So now here is gonna be my fixation apparatus. I'm gonna use a cortical button and I'm gonna do a suspension, double loop reconstruction or doubling up of the graft. So 
I'll show you here. So there is the cortical button and there is the loop. I'm gonna pass my semitendinosus graft through the loop. So what you can see is I have my, my graft, the loop, the cortical button, the sutures for the cortical button, and then my suture shuttle. So one long train. And so then Christy in the front, she's gonna pull on the suture shuttle. There you can see it happening live and, and also on the camera. So there's our suture shuttle. She's pulling on that. There are the sutures for the cortical button. There's the cortical button. There's the loop. And then there's our doubled over graft. And remember, I only sutured one limb of the graft. So that's why the graft slides through the loop. And so now this is the front of the shoulder. I'm going to pull out my cortical button, flip the button. And so now we have our suspension fixation of our tendon transfer. And so now what I'll do is, is the free limb of the graft is I'm gonna tension that and pull on that, place the arm into maximal external rotation and abduction and secure the free limb back to the lower trapezius. So I've got a looped reconstruction. There you can see the graft right there. So that's uh, the lower trapezius tendon transfer arthroscopic assisted using a semi-tendinosis looped graft with a cortical button suspension technique, very similar to an ACL. So my thought is, if we can stabilize the ACL with double loop to semitendinosis, we can also do it with a lower trapezius tendon transfer. So this is his patient. He's one year post-surgery. Uh, and we'll see his external rotation in just a moment. It's not perfect, but he can get to probably about 20 to 30 degrees of active external rotation. He's happy because he can actively external rotate to get his hand uh, behind his back. So this is what's reported in the literature with this technique. This is my friend Bassem LSM's paper published in JCS. A uh, 33 patient, good outcomes, significant improvement in all of his patients, improved active external rotation, which I think is the key. Uh, this is my series. I looked at my patients over a two year period. I had 26 of them. I have not updated this since 2018. Uh, subjective shoulder value 33 to 81. So an improvement. Active forward elevation from about 90 to about 130. And this is the key in this, in this patient cohort, they all had true external rotation lag signs. So they went from a lag sign to 26 degrees of active external rotation. So not 45, not 60 degrees, but they had about 25 to 30 degrees of active external rotation. And so here's a picture of the, the technique. So we have our cortical button here, our loop suspension. Here's the roll, doubled over semitendinosis graph secured uh, to the lower trapezius. So in summary, I think this is a good salvage operation for patients that have a massive irreparable or failed posterior superior cuff tear with a lag sign. The problem is there's several confounders when I do this. I, in, when I do this operation, I always do a biceps tenotomy or a tenodesis, which may be the reason they get pain relief. I also always do a partial rotator cuff repair. So I try to fix as much of the rotator cuff repair as possible which may also be a confounder as to why they're doing better after surgery. So the one thing I will tell you is that this is an operation that's being done with a fair degree of frequency now, but the, all the outcomes are short-term. We don't know how this operation does in the intermediate to longer term. It may not do well, or it may be successful. I'm hoping that this is a good solution that will hold people off until they get a reverse. One of the issues is, is that over time, I've had this happen in one patient is, is that the graft can stretch. And so then they get their lag sign again as the graft has stretched uh, and they start to lose that active external rotation. One patient. So uh, the majority of these patients have done well. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. George. Uh, it's a skill and excellent technique. Uh, can I have a question? For sure. Uh, George, uh, I think you were, the tunnel exit, I think more on the anterolateral aspect of the uh, proximal humerus, isn't it? Is the quality of the bone, is it a concern when you use an endo button? So, um, so what I try to do is, is I try to always have the exit through the biceps groove. So okay. and if, if I don't get that pass in the biceps groove, so say if I miss and it's in the tuberosity, or if I miss and it's coming out the greater, if it's a younger person, I'm okay with that. If they're an older person, I'll reorient the guide pin until I'm directly in the biceps groove because that's the best quality bone for the cortical button for me. Uh, I just don't want the cortical button to fail. 
So I, it is a concern for me, and that's why I do it in the biceps group. Okay, thank you. So George, what is your average diameter of the graft, the hamstring? Yeah, so I, um, the average diameter, I, I don't know, but what I do know is I make the tunnel eight millimeters. By making the tunnel eight millimeters, I can slide the graft in there. So when people do ACLs, I remember when I first did this technique, they wanted me to size the graft, make the tunnel the same size of the graft to wedge it in there. The problem with that then in my hands is I can't slide the graft and tension it. So I want the tunnel to be bigger. And so far I've been using an eight millimeter reamer and I can still slide it in there to tension it. So I prefer that technique. George, Sorry. George, you you leave the gap on the top of the head. I, I saw that you you have a big size tear, right? But you just um cover just the back. You have the hamstring graft, but on the top is still nothing on the top, right, George? So, with this tendon transfer, my goal is to recreate external rotation. So I do not put it up high. I put it directly where the infraspinous inserts posteriorly. So superiorly, what I'll do is in this, this case, I actually conducted a partial rotor a cuff repair. I didn't show the full video, um, mm. but what I'll do is once I do the, um, yeah. once I do the, uh, the, the graft, I'll do the, um, the partial rotor cuff repair. Partial cuff repair together, right? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if this video is gonna come up. Uh, this is the full video of this patient. And so we'll go. Or maybe it's not. No, I don't show it. Sorry. I, I will usually do the full. Um, I think it's, is it here? Yeah. So in this tech, in this video here, you'll see that I'll do the full repair. So in this case here, I'll keep on going. And so now I'm grabbing the superior cuff and I'll try to sew, sew it over to try to get as much coverage as possible. So here I'm gonna do a double row repair. And so if you remember in this case, the MRI, he had grade two fat infiltration within supra, but yeah, right. the infra was grade four. So oh. I could fix his supra in this case. So in this case, I'm gonna fix the supra. So I'll speed up so you can see what I'm doing, fixing supra, double row supra repair. Mm -hmm. And then once I fix the supra, I decided, well, maybe I'll um, I'll do a side to side for the, um, to cover the graft up too. So here I'm doing a side, there's the graft, I'll pause that. So here's the graft, here's my super repair. So then I did a side to side repair uh, mm -hmm. of the Terry's minor to my uh, super spine. So I try to cover it, but if I can't, I leave it. Okay. George, can I ask a question? Sanjay here. Oh, for sure, Sanjay. Uh, I presume that you measure the length of the trans-osseous tunnel to, to decide the length of your loop. And I guess it's a fixed loop. So that's right. So in my hospital, unfortunately, we only have 15 and 20 millimeter loops. I wish my hospital would pay for the dynamic loop where you can shorten it and long it. So what I have to do is I have to do the math, measure the tunnel. If it's 50 millimeters, I got a 20 millimeter loop. I got to then make sure I have enough five millimeters to flip the loop. So I have to do the math, yes. But then uh, your length of the hamstring is good enough to uh, loop it and it reaches back to the trapezius uh, muscle? In every, usually? Case, every case except one. Yeah. Then you might be suturing onto the tendon itself, I guess. Right. And I didn't like that, yeah. but I did yeah. that and he actually did okay. But so I don't like how about so. So how much uh, is the length of the semi-T that you would uh, want? It's different for every patient. So you'll have a small little woman and you won't need it that long. And then you'll have a, a big man like yourself and you might need, uh, you know, 16 to 20 centimeters. So it's, it's it, I can't tell you what length is critical. So what I have done is I have changed the technique slightly. So now what I do is see in this part of the video right here, I'm basically, um, I secured one limb first. I've stopped doing that. I leave both limbs free, pass them into the tunnel. Then I equalize the limbs, tie one limb, and then pull the other. So that I don't have the problem of having one limb be short. Of a mismatch, yeah, yeah. 
So I've changed. Uh, and the reason I changed is because that one case where I couldn't get it back to the tendon, I couldn't get it back to the, the native muscle and I had to suture it to the tendon, which I didn't like. And, and would you have considered adding an interference screw in the transosseous tunnel at the entry point? I have not done that. Um, I think it's a, to it's avoid, a good to, to avoid uh, abrasion, yeah. Yeah, uh, I must admit I haven't done that, um, but it's a good suggestion. I think uh, my hospital may have issue with it because we are a very cheap hospital. I can barely get them to pay for the cortical button. So they won't pay for the fixed, the, the variable cortical button. But I think that's a good option if you have, if you can afford it to put that in to stabilize it. Uh, I just would want to be careful not to damage the graft. Right. So George, I, I concern about the angle because your graft come this way, right? And your tunnel is like nearly perpendicular. So when you try to pull the graft back, so that's like the, the acute angle mm -hmm. and your graft is really thin most of the time. Sometimes in women, you can, you can pull and you can cut through the graft because yeah. of this acute angle. So Do you have concern about that? It's it is, it's not a 90 degree angle. It's a little bit more oblique because the tunnel is coming out. But mm -hmm. I talked to Jean Canny about that. He's got a lot of experience with latissimus and he felt that with latissimus that there was a, a concern about that. With lower trapezius, he didn't find that as concerning. And, and I have not, I've only had one patient stretch out on a delayed basis. I haven't had a graft rupture yet, but it, it may happen for sure. Uh, I find the bone in the posterior part of the greater tuberosity once I put the graft in, that the tunnel almost kind of not collapses, but it um, ovalizes with the pressure of the tendon against it because the bone is, as you know, is soft back there. And maybe that's why it doesn't have that sharp edge still. But yeah, I haven't right. had that a rupture that I know of yet. And it, and it may happen. Really nice. Thank you, George. George, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, of does does teres minor uh, whether it is present absent does it affect your outcome after the tra uh, transfer? Um, very very good question. So the, we know the, the more we see the teres minor and the more hypertrophy we see the teres minor, we know that every operation does better. Partial rotator cuff repair, SCR, reverse shoulder arthroplasty does better with an intact teres minor. So. In my patients, whether they have a teres minor or not, I still do this operation. My thought is, is if they have a teres minor, they probably have a, a better chance at a more successful outcome because we know that a hypertrophy teres minor uh, has is a very important muscle. My question I still don't understand is, is in this patient, he had a good teres minor. So if we show the video right at the beginning, look at his teres minor, it's beautiful. But why did he have an external rotation leg sign? So some people have a teres minor and still have external rotation leg, and some people have a teres minor and don't. And he failed a previous operation, and he failed therapy. So I still think there's more to learn. But I agree with you, and I know that what you're saying is that the teres minor is a good muscle. Whenever we see it, it makes us happy. Okay. And second question: When you uh, harvest trapezius insertion, how much do you mobilize it? By how much centimeter? Oh yeah. So basically what I do is I completely detach it off of the uh, scapula. And then I just get my finger and I bluntly split about a centimeter past the, uh, the attachment just to separate it from the medial portion. I don't go too far medial for injury uh, to the to nerve. So just a little blunt dissection. And it usually comes fairly, I mean, it comes quite nicely. Um, okay. Okay, Sirish. Uh, there are a couple of questions from audience. Uh, George, uh, how do you decide how much tension to give for your double looping the graft? Very good. So basically, I put the arm in about 60 degrees of abduction, maximum external rotation, and I tie it as tight as I can. Uh, and so I, I don't have anything other than I tie it tight. So, and then I leave them in an external rotation brace. I don't know, 15 degrees extra rotation brace for eight weeks to get it to scar in. So it's all for, I tell them this is a long recovery because I want them to get tight. And whether truthfully this functions as an active transfer or some sort of static periscopular stabilization that allows them to actively extra rotate, I don't know if it's a tenodesis, myodesis, or an active transfer, but it, it works for me. Uh, but so, yes, I tie it very tight. I don't leave it loose because they all will stretch out a little bit. 
Okay. The Josh, last push. question. So the trapezius, lower trapezius, the excursion is very short, right? So you do, do you think this is act like the dynamic or static or function of this tendon? So because the new thing the excursion is the, very short, right? You yeah. know. Excursion short, but the excursion of infraspinatus and yes. teres minor is also very, very short. Yes. So the yes. excursion matches. And as I mentioned, I don't know if this is a true, true active transfer or yes. some sort of myodesis tenodesis. Yeah. If it was a myodesis tenodesis, I would still do it because it works. Mm -hmm. If it was an active transfer, I would still do it. So whether it's active or passive, static or dynamic, it still works in the majority yeah. of my yeah. patients. That's why I still choose to do it. And it yeah. works for me, for me, it works better than latissimus. Mm -hmm. okay. George, in the, in the same vein, another question is, excursion of lower trapezius, lower than latissimus dorsi, then why lower trapezius? Be uh, because it's the same excursion as, it's a closer excursion match to the infraspinatus than latissimus. Right. Okay. The another right. question is, what is the diameter of your button which you use? Oh. Seven. I don't know. <laughs> because it's an 8mm tunnel which you're using. I have seven millimeters. No, it's a 4.5 millimeter tunnel through and through. Okay. And an 8 millimeter dilation to the point that I can flip it. So okay. it's only one the entry point is going to be 8mm. For the, the entry graft, point, yes. Graft to and go the in. exit is 4.5 millimeter. So I don't know what the, I'm sorry. It's just the regular AC. Well, uh, my, whatever one my knee surgeons use, I say I want the same one. Okay. The other question is, have you ever faced a situation where the endo button has flipped and the graft cannot be tensioned because the graft doesn't slide through the tunnel? Yes, that's happened once. I could, no, I've never had a situation where I could not flip the cortical button. I've okay. always been able to flip the cortical button. Okay. The, the tensioning of the graft, where the graft got caught, that was one of my first cases because my representative, the rep from the company, felt, felt that I wanted to do this like an ACL where we want to get tight fit of the graft within the bone. So he was telling me, okay, measure the graft. It measures, you know, six and a half, you use a six and a half drill. So I made that mistake that first time of making it line to line. And then I couldn't do that. So my solution was it was still fixed within the bone. So it wasn't moving. So I just tied it to the lower trapezius because it wasn't sliding. I just had to, it was harder to pull it over and do the tying. Okay. Thank you, George. Uh, that was an excellent talk. And uh, I think we had a lot of, uh, we learned a lot. Thank you uh, so can much. you unshare your screen, please? Uh, so that, uh, uh, can you unshare your screen? So that Bancha can go for his next talk. So, <clears throat> you see my screen? Yeah. So this uh, this talk is about the arthroscopic uh, superior capsular reconstruction. Uh, so I did this uh, superior capsular reconstruction after I visit uh, this guy. Yeah, he's my good friend, Dr. Mihada, right? So, what's happened? Please touch the screen and move again. Yeah, okay. So uh, at that time, yeah, we have a lot of problem with the massive cuff tear. And I love this technique so much because uh, after I come back and I try to do ACR, I found very good outcome. So indication is uh, typically the massive cuff tear that is involved supraspinatus and in first spinatus is a postural superior cuff tear. And there's um, not too much you know, cuff tear atrophy like Hamada one or two. And the patient should have good uh, substance. Sorry, sorry to interrupt Dr. Mancha, sorry. Yes. Uh, you need to start the slideshow. Slides are not moving. Slide not moving, right? 
Yeah. Just click on the slide here. Click on the slide. It's moving? No, not yet. Excuse me? We can just see the first. Oh, oh sorry. So, I go to IS sharing again. Yeah, please. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'm sharing again. Yeah, we could see it very well. You can go back to the first slide from start from yeah. It's working now? It's working. It's working. Uh, yeah. it's not coming okay, to the perfect. Work. It's okay. Yeah. It is okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. You see this guy? Yes. Mihata. Right? So I visited Mihata at that time many years ago, and I learned from him, right? This is an indication for the uh, math, for the uh, SCR. Yeah, we mainly is a supraspinatus, infraspinatus tear, and Hamada type one or two. The patient should have the intact subscapularis or repairable subscapularis, okay? So I prefer to use the fascia lata, and, but I heard that from uh, many countries like the Western side, they prefer to use the synthetic graft. So the patient that uh, we do is the patient that have irreparable calf tear, right? The patient may have pseudopolalysis and also muscle atrophy, HI less than seven and cutaria three or four, okay? Pate type three, okay? So the goal is the, to prevent the suprahumeral head migration and restore the Show the function for scopal. So I think this uh, supracapsular uh, reconstruction is act acting like the soft tissue uh, buffer is a static stabilizer. Yeah, it's act like balloon because uh, hey, Mihata said that the thickness of the graph should be very thick. It should be more than eight millimeters. If you have a very thin graph, so, so the, the result will not be so good. So I show this patient, he, this, is, this, this patient is 70 years old. He has the massive loaded calf tear and job test positive, okay? So he has so much pain and yeah, and also external rotation left side positive, okay? So the patient have good to less minor. So this is X, his X-ray. So the supraspinatus is retracted to the green oil level, pate three. But the patient have intact subscapularis and also the thalus minor, okay? And fatty degenerations. So first, we do this technique. We do the uh, decubitus, same like Mihata. But uh, actually, I'm a big check guy. So I'm not happy to use this lateral decubitus. I have problem with my shoulder because when I do that, I need to twist my body and I have uh, my AC joint pain and my back pain. So after that, I want to come back to my beat chair again. I will be happy if I do this in beat chair position. So this is my position, right? You can do the fraction adduction internal rotation like this way and prep and drape this way. And you can work two teams, right? Okay, one team harvest the graft. Another team is to prepare the, the, uh, the SCR, okay? So, this is uh, our techniques and we have portals. Most of the time we have uh, four, five portals, right? Two in the front, two in the back, and also uh, one uh, Naviasa portal. So this is our portal. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, okay? So first we harvest the fascia ladder, okay? You do fraction adduction internal rotation, okay? And yeah, you identify the tip of the of the GT of the tocanter, okay? And then another team is to prepare the graft. So the key is you need to have the, most of the time the length is about 10, right? And the width is about four, okay? So you have about four by five centimeters of the graft, okay? So after you have where's that? So you make it thick, so the thickness should be at least eight millimeters. That's quite important. So after that, yeah, we're cleaning the, uh, 
bursal site, remove all the bursal tissues, okay, stop the bleeding. Okay, this is quite important to make it clean. Okay, so this takes you some, some time. Okay, and also cleaning the soft tissue at the crinoid, subocomian cleaning until you get this. Okay, until you get this, you clean two blood stick and bursal tissues. Okay, after that, we preparing the bone bed, right? So we prepare the two blood stick. I always use shaver, not the burr, because uh, sometimes we, we make uh, too much bone removal. Okay, and this is the less of the cuff. I, I remove the uh, superior labrum. Okay, identify the green oil and I save the less of the rotator cuff. Okay, like that, and then measuring the size in AP and medial lateral diameter. Okay. After that, uh, we put the anchors on the green oil. Okay, I prefer to use triple load. Okay, so we have totally twelve. Tapping. So this, this area of the bone is quite hard. So I always tap. I use two, okay? One in the front and one in the back. So this portal is coming from, uh, it just in front of the AC joint, okay? Very careful, you should not penetrate to the articular surface, okay? Always looking. The direction should go from uh, lateral to medial, okay? You have See that you have your 12 sutures. After that, we're passing these sutures into the rotator cuff. So it's, this is like you do the side to side repair. We do this the same in front and back, okay? This way. And also I pass my suture into the rotator cuff. So after I repair my SCR, I will put my rotator cuff underneath the stump of the rotator cuff. So you have two surfaces of healing. One is healing on the green oil, and then also you have healing on the rotator cuff, okay? So I will pass my suture in different colors. You see that this blue, this green, right? So this soft tissue will cover the rotator cuff again after you tie the knot on the green oil, okay? And then next step is to make the anchors at the GT, right? So after we make a good raw surface on the GT, we make micro fracture and shaving. Okay, we have the six, this is triple, right? And then you pack the suture, okay, to the rest of the cuff. I put my suture in front to impulse spinatus. And in the front, I put it into the uh, rotator, uh, the comma tissue, okay? The rest of the uh, rotator interval, okay? And Actually, Mihata, he, he did repair the SCR, the graft into the anterior tissue. But I think I, I think repairing the graft in front and back should be fine. And then next step, I use my finger to dilate, okay? That way, okay? So the size of your index is enough, okay, to put the graft in, okay? And then next step, okay, we put this, Suture, okay, now we're ready. And this is our suture in the graph. We, we put the thick, thicker part on the medial side, okay? And the next step is I put the syringe, 10 cc, and retrieve the suture one by one and pass into the graft. Okay, you see that? We put the suture, we take two sutures pass into one hole. Okay, that way. That way, okay. We do that one by one. So you need to do it in, in, in a very, uh, be careful the suture can tangle. So put it one by one like that. Okay, good. So all these sutures will be in the same hole. So that's why we need to use the big cannula. So this cannula is the syringe 
and I already cut it, so I can easily take it out. Yeah, it's not, it's not difficult. Okay, that way. Okay, the last one. Okay, that way. Yes. Good, now complete, okay? The next step is to pass the grab in. So the trick is I, I put one suture into the Navier portal. You see this one? Okay. And then I put it through the Navier portal. So this is like one way, okay, one direction. And then you can take this syringe out because this syringe is, is uh, we cut it. So we can easily take it out like this way, okay? And then use your finger to push this garb in. And very careful is not go upside down, okay? That way. And then put the grab in, okay? This way. Then put the grab in. Okay. Then the grab is coming inside the joint. And the next step is to, you need to do the side to side repair like this. So when you do side to side repair, yeah, the grab will be spreading, you see? It will be in order. And another trick is you can put the switching stick to put the grab, it will not floating. Okay, so you do this way, front side to side repair, front and back. And then you tie the knot, okay, to the green oil. One by one. So in one hole, I have two sutures. Okay, that is important because uh, this gap is very thick, you need to secure the grab to the green oil, okay? That way. And after I tie this grab to the green oil, then I will pass my, the rest of the suture into the stump of the rotator cuff. Okay, you see that switching stick is very really helpful. And then you see that this purple is the suture that was in the stump of the rotator cuff. Okay, then you pass this uh, suture after you tie the knot, you pack this suture into the rotator cuff, okay? And then you can have the two surface healing. The graft can heal on the green oil and also can heal to the cuff, okay? So you can have this picture. See, this is a graft and the rotator cuff will cover on the graft again, okay? Like this way, okay? Because in the past, I have some patient that they have problem of healing on the green oil side, but on the tuberosity, we have no problem, right? So this is the, in the past, I did not put the graph underneath the rotator cuff, okay? And we have some patients that uh, have delayed healing or non of the, no healing to the green oil, okay? The next step is to make the uh, repair side to side. This is at the distal part, okay? repair the grab to the infraspinatus in the back and repair the graft to the comma tissue or the rotator interval in the front, okay? Like that way. So after that, we tie the knot. This is at the getter to velocity. We tie the knot, okay, one by one. We need to tie the knot. In the past, I also used knotless and we found that this tissue is too thick. If you did tie the knot, there will be no pressure on the footprint. So I recommend you to tie the knot. Don't worry about the type two tear or tissue strangulation because this tissue is very really thick. It's not like low data cuff, okay? So I never have the problem of the type two tear after this ACR. So you need to tie the knot, okay? And then you take these 12 sutures separate it in six and six, okay? One in the front, one in the back, okay? And very careful, you should spread this suture in the very front 
very front is close to the bicep group, okay, and also in the belly back, okay, that way. Okay, after tie the knot, then you put this to the, in the front, you're going across to the bicepital group. Okay, like that way. Yes. So you have six and six, okay. So this is a final repair. Okay, you have these 12 sutures because we want pressure distribution to the footprint, right? Okay, and that on the medial side, you have repair to the green oil, also repair to the rest of the cup. Uh, this is the pre-op x-ray. You see that the HI is very narrow and post-op x-ray, HI is getting better. Okay, and so this is the post-operative x-ray. Okay, the patient quite happy. So this is the one year after the surgery, the patient very happy. Actually, he came to see me last week because he's falling from the from the height from the second floor, but his SCI is still intact. Yeah, it's not tear. Okay. So in summary, the SCR using the fascia lata, okay, I think it works very well and the result is pretty good. And nowadays, I prefer to use this big chair position because it's I. I'm the beach chair guys. I'm very happy to do the SCR in beach chair position. And our graph is very high uh, healing rate and also very low complication. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pancha. Cake, and what is the thickness of your graph which you put in? Uh, it at least eight millimeters. Most of the time is about nine to 10 millimeters. Yeah, any questions from other panel? Can I ask Sundar a question yes, to, uh, nice, yeah. nice, nice technique, Bancha, very impressive. But is George around or is George gone? Uh, no, I'm here. George, yeah. George, it is a question to you in relation to SCR, Bancha just showed. Has your incidence of SCR reduced after starting to do lower trapezius transfer? And if yes, how much percent have you reduced or stopped doing it? So I have uh, different indications for SCR and lower trapezius. Yes. Uh, I, do, I do SCR for patients uh, that have, <clears throat> they have intact external rotation. So if they have a leg sign, they get lower trapezius, they have intact uh, exhortation, they cannot have escape, and the main problem is pain. Um, and so I was doing more SCRs maybe three years ago than I am doing now. Um, my, I don't think my outcomes are as good as they were. Uh, my, I just haven't, uh, I'm not getting 80 to 90% good excellent outcomes. I'm um, somewhere around probably 60%. Uh, I've had some failures. I, I, I recently had a failure of, but it was using an allograft, dermal allograft. I had a failure where the patient had an aseptic synovitis with rice bodies everywhere. So I put a scope in and all these white little pieces of rice <clears throat> came out. And so I felt very bad about that. My first uh, SCRs, I did use a fascia. And then my, I did about, about six or 10 with uh, uh, dermal autograft. So I'd raise the skin graft, take the patient's dermis from their abdomen and use it and double and triple that. And those actually did quite good. The only problem is it took long. It took a long time to harvest an autograft for me. Um, and the fellow was working on that. So as mm -hmm. Bancho said, that's not, that doesn't, that's not fast, right? So if I, if, I, if I rephrase my question, George, say a few years ago, if you were, if you were doing 100 SCR, how many do you do now? Oh, okay. Or 10, I, 10 SCRs, how many you do now out of 10? So I probably do now this, well, this year is kind of funny because of COVID, but I would say I do between eight and 10 SCRs a year, not that many. 
uh, as against what you used to do 100, say, for example, oh, to no. give a percentage. Oh, yeah. So my, my first year of doing it, I probably did close to 20, like 15 or 20. I did a lot of them. And so now my, um, if they're older, I'll go to reverse. Um, so yeah, maybe doing eight, eight or 10 a year, not common. So, so it dropped by about 50%, that means, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would say, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you. Josh, do you think dermo and fasciolata is the same or not? Uh, George. So uh, if dermal autograft, mm -hmm. I think is probably the same as fascia, but I think dermal allograft, uh, I have had that one problem with it. I think your technique of fascia and stuff like anything that's the patient's own, I think it has to be better. Like, yeah. I mean, I think the rejection rate, uh, yeah. the antibody reactions, it has, I to, agree. I mean, my, it has to be better yeah. uh, in my thoughts. And so, but I agree with you. 100% that graph thickness matters. And it's just like the balloon. The balloon is eight millimeters, nine millimeters thick. That's why it works. Mm -hmm. If you, basically Mihata is putting a big balloon in there with sutures and what you're doing too. And I think that works. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to ask one question to Dr. Bancha. There yeah. are certain techniques which describe a uh, graph jacket or mm -hmm. uh, you know a cellular dermal patch which is fixed medially to the remnant of the tissue then getting fixed onto the glenoid. So does biomechanically, does it make any sense to suture it to the muscle than the glenoid? Yeah, uh, it's, it's different. You mean the, this scarf jacket is repairing to the rest of the cuff, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't agree. Yeah, because uh, this, if you do that way, you want it to be dynamic. You want it to repress the low data cuff, but this one is not. This is a static. Yeah, this thick tissue is blocking on the top. It's mm -hmm. acting like balloon, but this is the biologic balloon. You know, so right. it's act like the buffer. Okay, and it can heal on the green oil, also on the tuberosity, and it's not migrate. It's not like balloon, right? And this is biologic tissue. That's my idea. So this okay. is like the buffer, static stabilizer block. Proximal migration. Okay, mm -hmm. that's why it's work. Any other questions from panel? Okay, uh, I think uh, if there are no further questions. Uh, can we conclude this meeting, uh, Sanjay, sir? Yes, thank you so much. Enjoy it. Thank Bye. you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you, George, and uh, thank you, Bancha. Uh, good fun. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank I wish you, everyone George. A thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, everyone. Uh, time to thank uh, Dr. George and the bunch uh, uh, for your excellent presentations and uh, oh. I think we lost someone. Well, I, I hope everyone has a, a great weekend and stays safe. Uh, it was yeah. a pleasure. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet up uh, yeah. somewhere along the lines. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. It's Bye. morning for us here. <laughs>